Thanks for interrupting you. Uh, okay, I guess we have not started with it. My apologies. Oh, started now. We're good. Please excuse me. Thank you. Okay. Now we have started. Um, a live person has told me this. So um, that's good. Well, welcome. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to this uh, panel on data governance and international trade. Uh, we have a great uh, assemb assembly of experts here from a wide uh, range of um, perspectives, and I'll get to introducing them in just a second. But let me set the scene, if that's okay. Uh, many have argued that international trade benefits from cross-border data flows and vice versa. Trade has benefited from global connectivity and also has accelerated it. Small and medium-sized enterprises um, using web technologies extensively are growing more quickly and exporting goods and services more widely. New business models have emerged, technologies and services have evolved, and the combined forces of the internet and trade have promoted the transmission of ideas and innovation. Some other webinars have highlighted risks associated with the internet, like uncertainties about the use of data, cybercrime, disinformation, surveillance, malware, and other online threats. These uncertainties erode users' trust and in turn affect how the internet is used. Eroding trust also seems to be affecting the way govern governments view the internet and regulate it. Governments aim to manage these risks, risks through a wide range of laws, regulations, uh, covering, for example, cybersecurity, privacy, or, or consumer protection. Some measures can foster the online trust that is necessary for digital growth and to protect other social values. At the same time, these measures can affect the way data is collected, stored, and transferred, transferred and therefore can affect trade in goods and services. However, today's webinar takes a different perspective. Some time ago, Professor Susan Aronson reached out to me and suggested that the WTO host a panel of experts on the role, if any, of WTO principles and rules on data governance. And uh, that's this, this workshop or webinar is the outcome of that outreach. I'd like to also thank Gabriel Marceau and Kiam Pasaguero for uh, their efforts to put this together, as well as uh, the administrative team, Carol Burrow in particular, and Anne Lescure. Um, they're all sitting around me right now. You can't see them, but um, it's great to have them here and to have our panelists up there on the screen. So um, some scholars have argued that the GATS, uh, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, for those who may not know, covers cross-border data flows because it provides a set of rules that can govern online services built on data. With the rise of the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence-based devices, goods trade and the WTO goods agreement are also increasingly relevant. Meanwhile, because the global internet is built on cross-border data, uh, cross data flows, we find that data governance often intersects with internet governance and both have implications for international trade. Internet governance can be defined as the rules, policy, standards, and practices that coordinate and shape how the internet is managed at the same time that trade negotiators are crafting international rules related to data flows, policymakers are developing national policies and regulations, as well as international rules to govern um, this global internet, the network of networks. Regulation affecting the underlying infrastructure and the data circulating often overlap. Nations often use data governance to try and do two important tasks to create an enabling environment to maximize data-driven innovation and to manage the potential risk brought by such innovation. Data governance is not easy, given the various types of data, as well as the magnitudes of data created, utilized, and flowing across borders. Often, different regulators, frequently with different objectives, regulate a piece of the governance uh, puzzle, and coordination between regulators 
addressing these cross-cutting regulatory issues is a big challenge. The ongoing e-commerce negotiations at the WTO could result in, um, uh, in it having a larger role in data governance. Such an outcome requires a broad understanding of the intersection of national and international data governance on the one hand and international trade on the other. So given this context, we have put together um, an expert panel, a diverse panel of speakers who will share their insights on governance, um, data governance and how they may intersect with um, uh, international rules. So we have eight distinguished speakers representing a variety of perspectives from law, economics, international affairs, and diplomacy. The panel members from international organizations include Martin Melanuevo from the World Bank. Welcome, Martin. Um, Dr. Vikram Haksar from the IMF. Welcome, Vikram. Dr. Javier Lopez Gonzalez from the OECD. Welcome, Javier and Lee Tuthill from the WTO. Welcome, Lee. Our academic speakers are Professor Joel Trachman from Tufts University. Welcome, Joel. And Dr. Susan Aronson from George Washington University. Hi, Susan. Um, and Professor Henry Gao from Singapore, Man Singapore Management University. Welcome, Henry. Good to see you again. Uh, one of the members of our WTO Chair's Advisory Board, and it's always good to see you, Henry. Um, and finally, we'll benefit from the views of Nicholas Schubert, uh, a Chilean government WTO expert uh, located in Chile. Welcome, Nicholas. These panelists will discuss how We'll proceed as follows. We prepared four questions for the panelists. Each question um, selected, for each question, selected panelists are invited to provide a short initial response of about three to four minutes. And then we invite an exchange among the panelists. And then we'll also, uh, on a couple of occasions, take um, questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A button rather than the chat box. The chat box will be used for logistical purposes like technical issues or perhaps sharing a link to a report. And please note that the discussion is being recorded. So, um, and, and that recording will be made available on the link that is now in the chat box. Uh, I hope it's in the chat box. I personally am not controlling that. Um, when do we so know? let's start with our first question. And the first question is, is data different? And if so, in what ways from other goods and services governed by the WTO? In your view, what is different about e-commerce in the role of data? And let's start with Professor Aronson, and then we'll go to Haksa Vikram, Javier Lopez Gonzalez, Lee Tuthill, and then Martin Molinuevo in that order. Professor Aronson, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you so much for organizing this webinar. Um, you know, I think we need to really acknowledge that data is very different from the other goods and services governed by the WTO. And let me give you a bunch of reasons. First, there are so many different types of data, and obviously there are lots of different types of goods, but some types of data require very specific rules, such as personal data or proprietary data. Moreover, the failure to effectively govern various types of data, as example, personal data, can undermine economic development and affect human agency, democracy, and collective self-determination. And given that the GATT began as a club of democracies essentially in 1947, that's something we should think about. Data can also be a, a public good, which government should provide, right? Access to information. Governments and firms hold large troves of personal data, which we find every day can be hacked or manipulated or stolen or injected with malware and viruses. So how you store data can affect not only individual security, but national security. And then the other weird thing about data is that data value isn't derived from what data is, but how 
And when firms use it, or researchers use it to create value with the data. And sometimes that value comes from sharing the data, and at other times it comes from hoarding the data and not sharing it and denying others the ability to create value with it. So this is weird economic contribution of data that we, we have to be honest about. Two other things, if I may. Trade in data is fluid and frequent, and because it occurs on this shared platform, the internet, location is hard to determine. Hence, nobody knows when it's an import or an export, right? So it's hard to govern some types of data by trade rules and some types of data, i.e. Um, when you tweet about, let's say foreign policy in one country uh, from another country, there's no transaction directly affiliated with that. So cross-border data flows may not fit the traditional definition of trade, right? Where you trade a good or a service for money. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, uh, let's move to Haksa. Haksa, please. Thanks, Bob. Vikram Haksa here. Uh, real pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, let me just say at the outset, the usual disclaimer, uh, anything I say today is my personal view. It doesn't necessarily represent the view of the IMF or its board. Um, so on the question of what's different about data, I think Susan got us off to a great start. And I would just add a couple of points from the sort of economic drilling down a little bit more into the economics of it, which is the topic I've written about. One is that data is what we would call non-rival. My use of data does not diminish your ability to use data. It's a very unusual resource in that way. And I think, frankly, one interesting question for, for sort of from a WTO perspective is should we think about data in the same way that we think about intellectual property, for example, where you, know, you may say that there is some diminution of the use of an idea if somebody else uses my idea, but is data different in that, in that regard? But one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, results of the non-rival uh, nature of data is that in principle, ceteris paribus, the more that data is shared, the better off we are. And uh, it, it can be shown that the widespread use of data can have important productivity effects. Uh, if you think beyond just the economic effects, if you think in the context of the pandemic, widespread sharing of data for biomedical trials, also something that can be very valuable in the context of finding new uh, uh, sources of medicines to deal with uh, the kind of problems that we have right now. So non-rivalry, I think, is a very, very important feature of data in an international trade context and something that I think is, is, is novel and something that we have to think about how we're going to deal with. I think the other point that I would emphasize is that data generates very particular externalities. And again, sorry to be using the economic sort of the econ jargon of externality, but basically the way to think about it is that data can, the use of data can have effects on other people. Uh, give you two examples out here. One is that if you use uh, my data, uh, you may reveal information about me that I don't necessarily want to have reveal. Give you an ex a, a classic example of that is, you know, if I'm on your social network and you friend me, and somebody is uh, sort of milking your social media data to be able to make uh, certain types of uh, say credit decisions, well, they may now have access to my information as well, and I may not have wanted that. And that would be an externality which we have to think about how to regulate. Uh, the other issue I think uh, Bob already touched on is, the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is, is cyber risk. All institutions, including financial institutions, have a very strong incentive to protect their own data. But from a systemic perspective, the question arises, do individual institutions internalize the systemic effect of cyber breaches? And is that something we should think about from a data regulation perspective as well? So these are some, there's a, there's a, there are many other features as well, but these are two that I would highlight that uh, uh, in terms of uh, the non-rivalry and the very particular types of externalities that use of data uh, can generate. Thanks, Paula. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, very interesting, uh, particularly the non-rivalry uh, non aspect. Um, and I think there's an, like IPR, there's an interesting know-how dimension to it because just because you have the data doesn't mean that you can extract the insights from it. So um, yeah, very interesting there. Javier, uh, your perspective, please. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege and pleasure to be uh, here. Also very difficult to follow Susan and Bikram. So let me, let me try and focus. I think we all agree that data is different. And maybe, let me try and maybe give a bit more thoughts on, on why or how data might be different. And sort of the first thing I wanna 
highlight is the multifaceted role that data plays in international trade. And certainly we're familiar with data as a mode of delivery of trade in goods and trade in services, but it's also increasingly a factor of production, uh, a way to codify knowledge and to transfer knowledge, a, a way through which we uh, coordinate our global value chains and also a way that we connect uh, international demand and uh, supply. It's also, of course, uh, critical in getting goods across borders. There's always a data trail that follows uh, all these products. So data really does play a multifaceted role. The other element I want to highlight is that data does not move like international trade, or at least in the way that we're used to international trade moving. Data travels in packets, and so files are broken down into their constituent pieces and sent via a path of least resistance, and then they're assembled at destination. So it's, it's not a linear movement, it's more of a scattered out movement that then homes in. And what's really important here is that the ultimate origin and destination of data is often a technical issue. Um, I might be trying to access a British newspaper, but actually in accessing it from France, I might actually be querying a site in Poland. So very clearly, it's very difficult to identify what the ultimate origin of uh, the data you're accessing is. And so one of the things that we see is that with modern cloud computing, data lives in many places at once. So we have different bits of data or copies of the data that are stored in different countries simultaneously. And you might get one piece of data from one server in one country and another piece of data from another server in that country. And again, that makes it more difficult to conceptualize in the context of international trade. The last thing I want to highlight is what's really different for me is the way that we interact with data. And Vikram sort of made the point, but I want to give you sort of an example, is that the idea that we leave a much bigger information trail in our economic activities. We used to go to the DVD store and rent a DVD, and we'd have a recording of what DVD we rented and when we returned it. Now, when we watch a streaming file, there's recording of data on when we've watched the file, whether we've liked it or not, what other files we associated with it, when we paused it. And so what's happening is that we don't really know um, what type of data is being collected and what use is being made of that type of data. Um, and so what's happened is that I think the control of personal information can affect the balance of economic power. So a retailer that holds very detailed information about you and your habits can essentially reduce your consumer welfare to zero. That is, it can charge you at your willingness to pay. And that makes the economics of privacy or of data knowledge uh, ambiguous. You can access free online services, but at the expense of your privacy. You reveal your preference about products so that you can get recommendations, but you risk uh, paying higher prices for goods in the future. So I think all of this gives a bit more uh, structure to, to the idea that data is different, but how perhaps data is different. Javier, thank you very much for that. Sorry, I have forgot to unmute. Um, now let's hear from Lee. Lee, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a slightly different perspective that I've talked about with some of my fellow, fellow panelists before. And um, I you know, don't know what's different about data and I'll go through two steps. First, if you look at it at information, you know, um, in 1990, when we were negotiating the GATT, we already had a clear understanding that services were very information intensive and often traded in information, all right? And uh, we even in our scheduling guidelines list telecommunications is one of the ways that you trade across borders. Um, we also, that's the entire reason for the existence of the Annex on Telecommunications of the Services Agreement. Uh, was because of the importance of data uh, uh, information and, and data networks to the supply of services, uh, all kinds of services, even at the time. Uh, perhaps the annex was a little ahead of its time, but it was already anticipated and it was already well known. Um, if you wanna talk about uh, information as data, because it happens to be going through uh, uh, telecommunications or, or digital networks, um, that was happening already too. The telecom annex was written because co companies were using private corporate networks. The annex on telecom was written because we already had what we called at the time value-added networks because the most basic telecom services were under monopoly. 
And those networks were being provided by service providers and uh, they were providing um, uh, data services uh, for companies and sometimes for individuals. Um, I think that, you know, you, you look at the aspect that, uh, you know, sometimes there's not a commercial transaction. We've had classified as a service broadcast television and things like that were absolutely free to the customer and um, had a commercial model of uh, being supported by advertising. And, you know, that is the model that many of the internet platforms have adopted. So that doesn't mean that, that, that services aren't being provided and trade isn't happening. I mean, if you think that even before the internet, uh, if you subscribe to a magazine, that magazine was not making any profit on what it charged you. It was basically using advertising and it was selling your personal data. It was selling your name and address to hundreds of marketing companies and advertisers. Um, your, your credit card bills would be examined by, the, by the, the retailer. And there's the story of the girl who bought a pregnancy test and started getting all these brochures in the mail about baby clothes and her boyfriend was like, what is this? You know, and this was long before the internet existed. Um, so you had satellite and data networks providing, uh, you know, information and what you might call data going way back to the early and mid nineties. And it was acknowledged in the services agreement. Um, the point of what is different today, I think the difference is not the nature of it or the fact that it's a part of trade and, and an integral part of trade. It's that the magnitude has changed and the technologies are more sophisticated. And this has had huge implications for regulation um, because internet, when it first started, was not heavily commercialized and they did not have the technology to buy and sell things initially and did not have the technology to do some of the things that today are very questionable and uh, even illegal activities going on in the internet. And I think regulators didn't realize the potential for some of these things like hacking, for some of these things like cookies could get huge amounts of data on individuals far beyond what might be in your, your uh, credit card showing what videos you purchased or uh, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a magnitude issue and there's the, it's so easy to collect so much data now. Um, so I think the real question is um, that this magnitude and the fact that everything can be done on networks now means that there's huge uh, you know, uh, governance problems. Some of them are related to trade. All of them may have implications for trade. Um, so I, 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 I beg to differ with the argument that something different is happening today that we didn't anticipate. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Lee. Um, I know somebody wants to respond right away and I'll come back to her, uh, but let's go to Martin Malanuevo um, for the final uh, set question on, uh, or set response to this question. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> it, and uh, thank you for having me. It's hard to add uh, after this um, a, uh, comprehensive set of, uh, of um, answers from our panelists, but let me just uh, try to dig a little bit deeper on uh, two points that I think were raised by Javier and, uh, and by Lee on, uh, on, well, on the multifaceted role of data and that data is a, uh, ultimately it's a, set, it's a mode of delivery of services. Uh, so specifically when we, when we think about uh, trading services, um, data to a large extent is is the medium through which services is traded. It's, it's not really the object of the transaction, but, um, but just the channel through which the specific service is, um, a, uh, is performed, is outlined. So if you want to compare it with trading goods, we can say that you know, some, somehow data is the equivalent to the you know, 20 or 40 feet long containers um, in trading goods. Um, is the package that delivers the, uh, the, the, the object of, uh, of trade. Um, and except, of course, in the cases where, you know, the special cases where you're actually buying a database. For the most part, you're buying a service um, that is transmitted 
through through data. And that service could be anything, you know, and that data, that information could be, you know, the cartoons that my daughters watch, the commands of an autonomous drone, the operative system on your phone, or, a, you know, or a photo of a naked child. So, <clears throat> You know, so understanding the difference between data and what it represents, you know, it's, a, it's important also in a policy perspective, because there you have to think where your policy concerns lie. You know, are you worried about the exchange of electrical pulses between machines? Are you worried about uh, people exchanging information, basically people communicating? Or you are worried about certain time of, of information being disclosed you know, or, or, or reaching certain people that shouldn't have it. You know, more often than not, the, uh, the policy concerns, right, lies with very specific types of information being disclosed or, or, or reaching certain, certain audiences that you don't want. Um, so in this sense, it's important to, you know, perhaps, you know, from a policy perspective, um, focus on the kind of concerns and the kind of specific types of information that you want to, to, to preserve and to protect, rather than thinking of blanket regulations on data that cover so much that in the end, you know, it may be way too broad, you know, to, to achieve your, your policy goal. And I think that's... Thank you very much, Martin. Um, so we've had quite uh, a powerful and succinct introduction to the issues here. And I'd like to thank the panelists. Uh, this is... Uh, this has been really, really quite good. Now it's open up to um, a broader exchange. Susan, I believe you want to uh, take the floor again. Um, Lee made some very, very important comments about the history of the GATT WTO dealing with data. And, but I, I do believe she did not address difficulties inherent in the nature of data. Um, you know, because first of all, in trying to um, analyze the data-driven economy, these days we often use proxies. It, our understanding is very inexact. I wanna make another key point, as we know all too well, many developing countries do not yet have a data-driven economy. And, um, you know, they are reluctant to govern data at this time. Obviously they do have, um, proprietary data rules, and many have personal data protection rules. But um, the issue of data, because it is so different from um, other sectors, so again, I repeat that I think that it is, and I think that it is for the reasons we have all given, um, I think that has a lot to do with the difficulties of governing data until nations and policymakers feel confident in governing it at the national level, I think it's going to be very difficult to find common ground at the international level in the trade regime. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but I think we have to ask you know, questions about um, how difficult, and we have to be sensitive to the difficulties that nations have in addressing this. Okay. Thank you, Susan. I think next we have Nicholas, then Joel, and then Javier. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Bob. Um, I think that what the panelists have said is is is, is very good uh, uh, in order to understand uh, what we're actually talking about when we talk about data. Um, I wanted to offer perhaps a, um, a step back perspective on it. Um, and the way we see data is uh, it's very important to make distinctions between kinds of data. Um, to us, and as a caveat of uh, everything I might say from uh, now on, uh, and I'm very focused on the technical side of things, uh, we see data as the way the internet works. Uh, this touches upon uh, what Javier uh, mentioned uh, a while ago, and also uh, uh, what Martin uh, just mentioned. Um, the internet is a data switching network that moves data packets from one end of the network to the other. And uh, the term data in this context has a broader meaning than uh, the, the meanings that many people think of when they hear the word uh, data. They uh, tend to associate it with personal data or information as uh, uh, Martin made that distinction, I think, uh, very well. 
um, and this is this distinction is important because depending on of the on the type of data, there's also different types of regulations and different layers that those regulations should be should should operate on. And from the perspective of a small developing economy with only 19 million people as a market, um, keeping the internet as a global uh, and open uh, platform for trade and for economic for digital uh, economic uh, uh, use. Um, is really something that uh, we are strongly in favor of. And uh, this encompasses the need to keep the internet moving data packets in an end-to-end -end way. And um, just a, a small comment to uh, what uh, Vikram uh, was mentioning about uh, this notion of uh, that data is non-rivalrous. Um, yeah, it's also a durable resource which uh, can be replicated and combined uh, without uh, being depleted. Um, and this reminds me of uh, a term that Stephen Weber uh, coined uh, that is anti-rivalrous uh, uh, when he was thinking about open source software. And uh, this to me, and uh, there are many uh, economists in, the, in this panel that can uh, perhaps uh, explain this better than I do. Um, this describes goods where the more people use them, the more utility each person receives from from the data, very similar to network effects that we see in other uh, in, in other instances of this discussion. So, um, I think perhaps the challenge of or one of the challenges that we have is bridging this uh, gap in understanding from the technical perspective that uh, Lee Tuthill does very well, and uh, the regulatory, the more uh, legal in nature regulatory approaches that we have. Um, we are dealing with something that is. Uh, in nature different, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, to traditional services and, uh, and goods. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, I'm gonna have to make a, a decision here as a moderator. I'm going to take Joel's question. And since Javier, uh, Vikram and Lee have already intervened, we'll take Joel's question on this topic and we're gonna move to the second question. I hope that's okay. Keep your thoughts in mind. It may be relevant in the next set. Joel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion. I, I took Lee's comments to suggest that what's new is that data is digitized, and, and that really does change uh, a lot of the context. And, and I wanted to focus, as uh, Nicholas just suggested, on, on what's different legally. Uh, Susan mentioned that it, it's not fixed in territory, and, and because of that, uh, territorial concepts of regulatory jurisdiction are challenged by uh, the digitization of data. And as uh, Vikram suggested, there's increased spillover, both at the firm level, but also at the state level, with different states' uh, quality of regulation affecting um, the, uh, the welfare of, of other states. And uh, maybe we can speak about that, but I wanted to make that legal observation. Thanks, Joel. Excellent observation. And then, of course, we have Martin's point. You don't know what's in those packets, right? So um, that can be really challenging. Okay, let's move on to the second question. Thank you all. That's that, uh, very, very um, interesting comments and insights. So second question, how, how do states regulate various types of data at the national level? How is data regulated domestically? Does this regulation reduce trade in services or goods? First, let's hear from Joel, and then we'll go to Nicholas, Martin, Javier, Susan, and Vikram. Uh, you've been doing a good job keeping your answers short, so let's let's keep up that uh, that excellent track record. Joel, thanks, Bob. So this digitized data has become pervasive in advanced economies, and as uh, uh, Martin and others suggested, uh, we're really talking about a new form of expression and old forms of regulatory concerns. So we've got, and I'll just list them quickly, the, the ones that come to mind, privacy, consumer protection, cybersecurity or security, taxation, intellectual property, competition, election integrity, anti-discrimination, censorship, and I'm sure we can add more, but uh, virtually every aspect of the state's intervention is implicated here. And so we don't want to put this all under 
data regulation. It's a, a bunch of other kinds of regulation that are challenged by the digitization of this kind of, um, of operation. And I think of uh, Angela Merkel's uh, claims of digital sovereignty. And, and in a sense, those claims of digital sovereignty um, are, are also claims for the EU of digital extraterritoriality, of trying to reach out and govern the world. Uh, and some might even suggest digital colonialism. Um, there's also uh, a geoeconomic security perspective here that we see in the United States trying to deny security competitors access to data that can feed artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, uh, plus uh, the question of competition to be the leading economy in this area. All of those things alongside the core WTO issues of market access and concerns about protectionism in a new guise. Um, so I think it's important that uh, this different kind of medium, uh, which, which changes the substance in important ways, means that states can't achieve their regulatory goals alone. Um, and it also means that efficiency will sometimes require um, uniformity or harmonization, the Brussels effect that Anne Bradford uh, described. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Excellent. Uh, very, very important uh, food for thought. Nicholas, um, please, let's hear your views on this. Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, in the case of Chile, um, we the framework is set up by uh, our constitution when we talk about uh, domestic regulation uh, and the public economic order uh, that this constitution frames. So we have a general rule that allows uh, data flows with really narrow exceptions on localization, uh, both domestically and internationally, but uh, we're also on the process uh, um, of updating our data protection law. And um, there's another piece of legislation that has proven to be really important to spur competition, innovation, and creativity uh, domestically, um, just uh, as, 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 uh, as Joel mentioned, uh, those goals are really important to us. And this is a law that, that was enacted in 2010, and it's called the net neutrality law, but it's really a non-discrimination rule on the, on the internet that forbids ISPs and other intermediaries to block or degrade the flow of data based on the origin, the destination, uh, or the information that the data packets uh, uh, contain. Uh, this domestic approach has a correlation in our trade practice because we recognize that digital products are born uh, borderless. So we have to ensure that the platform on which those products operate can operate uh, in a cross-border way. Um, the internet and the information that flows across it uh, uh, um, spans not only national borders, but also links societies and business globally. Uh, so this is something that we are uh, really keen on keeping. And uh, our, our international practice uh, uh, is very much aligned with our domestic regulation on the issue and it's uh, spurring innovation and creativity uh, on this platform that uh, spans globally. Thanks, Nicholas, for sharing that um, country level perspective as we have lots of speakers here giving sort of the international perspective and how, you, how Chile fits in to this global challenging environment. Um, Martin, let's come back to you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, well, first of all, let me uh, second uh, Joel in, say, in saying, well, date, talking about data regulation is, well, you, know, you really have to talk about some bits of what that regulation is about. Um, and uh, and in this uh, question of uh, you know how data, in particular data, uh, personal data is is regulated and how it affects um, uh, trade, in particular trade in services, is one of the points that we really try to uh, to look closely in uh, in our recent uh, world development report, precisely on on data for better lives. And, uh, and we came to some uh, very interesting uh, conclusions. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, first we started by looking at the current, uh, current regulatory practice on the treatment of personal data around the world. And we you know, established basically three models, um, or we defined the three models based on the, on the current regulations. One, what, what we call the open transfer models, which um, uh, relies 
for cross borders uh, for cross border data transfers mostly on private standards and from a domestic perspective it's characterized by not having a very comprehensive uh, a set of uh, rights on, uh, on on privacy for the individual. This is typically the model that uh, the, 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 that the U.S. follows at the at the federal level. Um, uh, we had another, you know, we de determine another model called the conditional transfers model, inspired mostly on the on the EU regulation, um, with a com with uh, a uh, extensive uh, a, um, <clears throat> data subject rights for data subjects such as consent and uh, right to access and right to deletion of data and in the cross-border aspect um, basically a set of conditions that must must be met um, ex ante in order to send the data to to the other jurisdiction um, be that that the regulation of the of the jurisdiction meets certain conditions or that the companies or the subject to, to which you are sending it um, meets certain uh, practices. And those are approved ex ante. And finally, we, you know, we determine a third model, um, which we call the more limited transfers, which is characterized with uh, some elements of the, of the conditional model, but also with the presence of more extensive restriction, because data in, a, in this uh, limited transfer uh, approach is seen some uh, um, closely related to matters of uh, security and, uh, <clears throat> and public uh, order and so on. So it's more tightly controlled. Um, the cross-border transfers under this model is, uh, is um, characterized by the presence of, of some restrictions as um, like, um, mandatory domestic processing or domestic storage requirement or the requirements of, uh, of prior approval for the sending of, of data abroad. Um, and a domestic perspective, it usually features a comprehensive set of, uh, of rules, but also features some important um, rules and protections for the individual privacy. But it also features some important exceptions for the government to be able to access that, uh, that information related to national security and, and, and public order. And this, and this limited transfer model is, um, um, is more closely related to, to the regulations that we can find in Russia, in countries like China, and so on. So with these three open transfer, conditional transfer, and limited transfer model, you know, we looked at the regulation in uh, over 100 and in 116 countries to see where countries stand. And we find that, that uh, the conditional transfer model is, uh, is currently the more popular um, with about uh, more than 50% uh, countries. And importantly, is the more fast, is the fastest growing model you know, of the um, regulations that have been adopted in the, in the last 10 years, more than 60% of the countries tend to adopt this conditional approach inspired somehow in the, in the EU re regulations. The open transfer is the second preferred with, uh, with about a third of the countries adopting this model. But importantly, we found that many of the countries that have this model in place is because they really don't have a regulation in place. So the, the open transfer is basically, is also the lack of regulation. Um, so countries that uh, don't have yet a comprehensive framework on, on data protection are naturally adopting this, uh, this open transfer model by default. And the limited transfer model, um, again, as I said, it was uh, adopted by Russia and, uh, and China, other countries like Nigeria, it, uh, it's uh, <clears throat> adopted more or less in 10% uh, in uh, in, in of, the, of the cases. Now, once we, we were able... Pardon? If, if I could, um, that was a very good answer, but I think we need to move to our next speaker, if that's okay. So, um, but do keep your thoughts in mind. And we'd love to hear from Henry at the end on perhaps his perspective on this uh, restricted uh, model. Uh, but now let's go to Javier. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna build on some of what you said, Martin, because we've got a very similar classification. That we have. But first of all, 
I want to build on what Joel, the uh, Joel's point on the different data. And I think that it's important to highlight that it's not just different data subject to different uh, data governance frameworks, but actually the overlap. In this. And that what makes it really, really difficult because it's very difficult to know who it is to regulate the data. So for example, personal information held by the private sector can be subject to privacy regulation, but also intellectual property. And even if you think about it, government access due to national security. So it's when those data spheres get together in that Venn diagram, where there are def different regulatory areas of influence where it becomes uh, really, really complicated. And I do think that who gets to decide is something that's very important in this area, in terms of at least international transfers and in the EU on whether it's, you know, DG trade that sets these up or DG justice, which is in charge of, of GDPR. Uh, building on, on the models that Mart Martin uh, was, was highlighting, I mean, we agree on these three types of approaches. Um, I'd like to highlight that, you know, although you can put them into three models, that there are hybrid approaches and it's actually quite complicated. So when you look at Australia, for example, Australia, when you're a firm in Australia, you are subject to uh, sort of the Australian privacy guidelines and it is the Australian firm that makes the adequacy decision. And so you see bits of adequacy and bits that you see in sort of the conditional models also appearing in the open transfer models. Where Martin and I probably do disagree is that I don't equate open transfer models to no approach whatsoever. Actually, in our analysis, we think that that's one approach is no approach whatsoever. And I'd say that even in the US where there's an open approach, you're still subject to the Privacy Act. And so it's an ex post accountability approach, which I think is very different to what we see in many LDCs where there is actually no data protection regulation uh, at all. Um, the last point I want to make is related to international trade and, and what we're seeing when we look at all of these different models. And while we see that there are legitimate reasons for diversity in regulation, the landscape that underpins these cross-border data flows is becoming increasingly complex. And this is having two important effects. The first one is that governments are uh, finding it increasingly difficult to to legislate in this space because it's very, very complex and their citizens data is flowing to different jurisdictions, a point that Joel made earlier, but also clearly for firms. And it's not just in terms of increasing costs of trade and of internationalization, but also if I'm a small firm and I need to protect the rights of an EU consumer and I'm located in Singapore, it's all very difficult to understand what type of data protection I have to afford to the particular customer that I'm trying to afford data protection to. So in this area, what we're trying to see is that a lot of governments are struggling and turning to different types of instruments in order to enable those data flows. And these can be domestic approaches, trade agreements, or plurilateral arrangements. And we can talk about these a bit later, but I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Javier. Uh, Susan, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. I want to speak broadly to this issue um, because I think that's an aspect of the discussion that we haven't done yet. And so um, I actually, um, as part of my research, mapped the governance of data at the national and international level for 52 nations. And here's what we found. You know, basically, obviously, nations have to regulate and it can distort trade, but not necessarily. It can also build trust. But I urge us to think broadly about it because I think how we regulate at the international level is very, very important for the health of the data-driven economy and data. And I think policymakers are not thinking holistically about that. Um, for example, current trade rules say, enforce your own laws, okay, uh, regarding privacy, spam, and consumer welfare. And I don't know, um, what is exactly in the current negotiation. So here I'm referring to various digital trade agreements. But by saying that, um, you know, essentially that doesn't build trust or an interoperable regime telling nations to enforce their own law. I wanna just go a little bit further. And I think, you know, we need to think about things like the relationship between digital trade and employment. Should digital trade agreements have language promote protecting gig workers? national security. <laughs> we need to think about, <clears throat> um, you know, how do, uh, it's not the job of the WTO to cover investment agreements, uh, but, um, you know, more and more nations are closing 
foreign transactions for national security reasons related to data, uh, that's something we need to talk about. Competition policy. Many digital trade, ex existing digital trade um, agreements say pretty words about competition policy, but they do little to share regulatory tactics, to encourage actual cooperation on, um, you know, how do you deal with firms that are bigger than many governments? You can't do it without cooperating internationally. These are things that I think we need to talk about when we talk about domestic regulation and trade regulation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Vikram, the floor is yours. Thanks, Bob. So just to pick up on what I think everybody has said, uh, data regulation is super complicated. And I think the issue is that, uh, I think Joel laid out a pretty long list. And I think there's more issues as well that you could probably stick into that list. And I think to my mind, the problem is that there are many objectives, many mandates and multiple regulators, ministries, you know, agencies that are in charge of it. We always talk about coordination problems in economics, coordination of monetary and fiscal policy. My view is that the coordinate, that there's a huge missing element of coordination in the data policy space. And the coordination challenge is much larger than it has traditionally been in other policy areas. So I think that's a really big challenge. And one example of that, just to give you a, a microcosm of it, many countries are pursuing open banking policies to increase data port portability within banking systems to foster competition. And these are typically being uh, man pushed by competition authorities. But you know, these things also can have potential financial stability implications as well. And, in some, and the degree of discussion and cooperation between the financial stability regulator and the competition authority in different jurisdictions varies. You know, some of them talk about it, but you know, is there really close cooperation out there? So I, I do think that that coordination uh, and cooperation, how to do it is something which is a big missing gap and something that I'll come to later on when we talk about international principles. Just to make one parting comment also, Bob, I think, you know, when we think about uh, data, the value of data and policies to regulate data, uh, one very particular feature of data is the whole privacy question, which looms over all of the economic aspects. It's a, it's a very powerful driver of policy. And there are many, I think, as Martin laid out, there are you know, basically different ways of thinking about uh, the privacy regimes that different jurisdictions may have. We would argue that from an economic perspective, a big issue is that the market for data is incomplete. Property rights, if you can call them, are not properly defined. And what we would really be looking for is a framework that gives control and agency to the data subject over their data, not just barring use or you know, filling out check boxes, but actually something that gives control. And we would argue that if this is done, we would have a better price for data and the multi-sided markets in which data is transacted. And we would then be able to also then assign control and valuation of data as well. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Vikram, for those excellent economic uh, conceptual insights. Much appreciated. Henry, can we hear from you? And then I'll go back to Matan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I will say a few words uh, regarding the Chinese model, uh, which is also spreading really fast to many development countries in particular. I think there are three features uh, for the Chinese model in terms of the data regulation. First of all, it is a very comprehensive uh, model in that it covers not only the regulation of the data, but also the regulation of hardware and also software. For example, in China, using a VPN is illegal because you can only connect to internet through government sanctioned international gateways. Uh, so that is a perfect example of a hardware regulation that uh, some development countries are also adopting. And second feature, of the Chinese model is that uh, China has uh, elevated data regulation to the level of national security and even national sovereignty. President Xi has a famous remark in which he said, there's no national security without a cyber security. So as you can see, China has elevated this to a very high level in order to justify its strict laws on data regulation. The third feature of the Chinese model is that in terms of the regulation of data and the sensitivity of the data, if you look at most other WT members, the focus tend to be on personal data, right? That is the EU approach, for example, when it comes to the GDPR and so on. But the Chinese approach, in addition to this concept of a personal data, 
also as another concept called important data. And uh, this is defined uh, in the cybersecurity law of China uh, as to uh, something that is related to information that is uh, generated or processed by so-called operators of a critical information structure. Uh, this term is defined very broadly to include important industries and fields, uh, which include uh, like energy transport, uh, finance, public services, and also anything that would result in serious damage to state security, national economy, and people's life, livelihood and interests. So uh, this is something could, uh, could, uh, that is very expensive. Uh, and if it's read uh, in a, a wide manner, could have a serious uh, impacts on all kinds of funds. So that is something that I think is also catching up in many developing countries. And that would be something that would need to be addressed uh, if the WTO negotiations uh, were to go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henry. So let's turn to Martin, who wanted to finish uh, some of his points, and then Lee has a question. So those will be our next two interventions. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. I um I just wanted to get back to you know, to the uh, to some of the effects or the implications for trade of this regulation on personal data, which was um, also one of the exercises that we that we were um, that we tried to to assess in. Uh, in, uh, in our world development report, also together with, uh, with our colleagues from uh, ESAI, you know, Eric van der Marel and, uh, and Martina Ferracane. And there, what we did was an, an econometric analysis, basically a gravity model, to assess the correlation between those three different regulatory models and how and, uh, and digital services trade you know, from those countries. And for each of those models, we were testing how the cross border rules and the domestic rules um, correlated with, uh, with their services trade flow. And in that sense, we found, uh, we have found that um, the cross-border rules of the so-called open transfer model um, is positively associated with, uh, um, with uh, digital services trade. So you know, in all cases, countries with cross-border uh, cross rules such as the US uh, tend to show greater um, digital services trend. Um, in the contrary, the limited transfer model was, was negative and the conditional transfer was, was mixed. We also saw that the, that the domestic rules of the conditional transfer model were also typically associated with greater digital services trade flows. Instead, again, the limited transfer model was, was negatively associated. So, you know, from this um, uh, econometric analysis, we can infer two basic, uh, you know, one main conclusion that, uh, that digital services trade is, is correlated with uh, strong domestic safeguards for individual privacy, such as in the US, and also with uh, flexible cross-border rules for, uh, for data flows. So if you want, the optimal regulatory solution would be matching those two approaches of having a, a strong domestic uh, framework and strong domestic protection in digital privacy to get complemented with somehow more flexible rules on cross-border data than, uh, than what the EU is, uh, is currently featured. That was you know, more or less our, uh, our econometric analysis. Thank you. Thanks, Martin, for bringing in some gravity model and frictions that uh, appear in the model. Lee, the floor is yours. You have a question or a response, right? Yeah, just two quick comments. Once about, one about Martin and uh, Martin's um, categories and, and OECDs, which were a bit more nuanced. Um, I, he was saying that about 50% of them are similar, and I think that's not organic. It's not an accident. There was a huge push to, to pass uh, measures that are very similar to GDPR once GDPR came out. And I'm not sure that will remain the standard because I, I read an article recently that even the EU is thinking they need to modify what they're doing and maybe make it better or worse, you know, but anyway, they, they're thinking of changing it. The other thing on Susan's point on collaboration, I, I participate in some of the groups that are doing collaboration. Um, 
on a variety of issues, but um, to my understanding, uh, cybercrime law enforcement people are collaborating internationally. You have international collaboration on standards through, through organizations such as the ISO. You have collaboration on, um, to some extent, on consumer protection. Um, but, you know, it is true these groups aren't talking to each other. And they're not aware of some basic principles, maybe that the trade people are looking at that would be important to what they do on the margins, you know, but we'll talk more about collaboration later. Thanks, Lee. Okay, um, now is we reach a point in our panel where we're gonna take some questions from the floor. So um, I'm gonna start with two questions open them up for responses. And if there is more time, we have about 20 minutes for this. Um, we'll see how long it takes to go through, uh, cycle through the questions. The quicker you are, the more questions we have, we can ask from the floor. So the first question is from Jakub Vishik. Um, how do you recognize data as, general, as a general non-rival good, while the whole idea behind commercial usage of machine learning and big data technologies is about gaining competitive advantage on the market. There's more to it, but I think that was a big enough bite to chew there. Is anybody, um, okay, I'll read the second question. This is from Marilla Maciel. Thank you for organizing the interesting session. You're welcome. Um, and thanks to our panelists. In the case of digitally enabled services delivered to users at zero market prices, for example, search engine, social media, would you consider this data to fit with the category of trade? Why or why not? Are data flow provisions being discussed at the JSI aiming to cover this type of data? Those are the two questions. I didn't see the order the hands went up in, but um, let's see, how many hands do we have up? Can you tell me? Five. Yeah, we so, so what I want to do is call on somebody who hasn't intervened very much if they've raised their hand to answer. Well, uh, all right. So now I see them. Go on, Henry. And Henry spoken. Well, Henry has spoken. A little bit. Um, uh, but uh, Henry or Joel, do you have an answer to either? Henry, you raised your hand. So we're going to go with you, Henry. OK. Uh, Thank you, Bob. I, I'm going to answer the second question first uh, regarding the data that is provided at no market price, or whether that is something that is considered treated. I think that is a very interesting question uh, because uh, if you look at the traditional definition of a trading services, for example, under the WTO, you can make an argument to say that uh, you know if there's no price, then there's no trade. When something is provided free of charge, you know, so uh, you can trace that back to, for example, Google's controversy in China ten years ago when they pulled out of China. Uh, I think at that time uh, a WTO case was discussed by the USTR briefly uh, on whether or not uh, you know to bring the case to the WTO to challenge China's restrictions. But in the end, uh, a case was not taken. Uh, I um, uh, speculate that uh, part of the reason was because uh, Google's main services provided in China was search engine services, which was purely free of charge. And there are other services like uh, advertising services were not really affected by Chinese restrictions. So that didn't uh, uh, provide uh, really the legal ground for them to challenge the restrictions. But I, I, I think that is the past position so far, and I uh, perfectly understand that, that uh, members might wish to reach a different type of a definition in the ongoing GSI negotiation. They decided that they would also cover services which are not really uh, sold and bought, uh, but are provided even free of a charge. Uh, I, I think there's always the possibility there. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Um, I think next was Vikram, then Susan. Thanks, Bob. Um, I think uh, just to answer Jakub, maybe give my version of the answer to Jakub's question would be, uh, sorry, would be that um, I think we have to distinguish between the value of data to the data subject versus the value of data to the data processor. And I would say that, you know, we don't always know clearly what the value of the data subjects data is, because as I argued, the market's not complete, it's not transparent, et cetera, et cetera. 
But, you know, the California proposal says we can have a data dividend based on the value of the individual data, but, you know, maybe the value of the individual data ain't that big. We don't know. There's not really a clear market. But I think the value that the uh, data processor uh, uh, generates by, you know, spending the resources to collect the data, agglomerate it, you know, write code to analyze it is something that is, I think, quite important. And I think it's, it's distinct from the intrinsic value of the individuals as data. And uh, that's why the argument would be made to look, can we have sort of effective consent management so that we can actually have a market for this thing that's not just, you know, sort of one side of the multi-sided market. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, Susan. Thank you, Bob. Um, I wanna give an example of how that plays out in the real world. And it relates to Toronto smart city where um, Google was gonna work with the city of Toronto to create the smart city that would be built on IOT and essentially AI. And a huge public movement arose in Canada opposing this smart city because it became clear that data that was once held by the public sector, but that was personal data, albeit aggregated, would be combined with proprietary data. And the end results, the analysis, would not accrue to the city and protected under the law by the city, but instead would accrue to Google. And that, that situation created this insight, if you will. And so the issue, as I said, I'm, I'm quoting from a scholar named Peter Leonard, who said, data value is derived not from why, what data is, but by what researchers and firms can do to it to create value with data. So again, if you can deny others the results of the data, which is what happens with data that becomes proprietary, it was once personal data, albeit aggregated. I think when we talk about this just as personal data, we miss the larger picture, which is how do you mix data in ways that it is still trusted by the people providing that data and the users of that data? And while that is not a WTO issue per se, it's something that we must all wrestle with. I wanna make another point which worries me greatly. I have yet to see a good study looking at the market for data, various types of data, um, and strategies to make it less opaque. And I think this is so important because I just cited this example. Historically, firms have had a lot of data, personal data about us. I mean, big companies like Sears, right, or Target, but never before has so many large platform companies, the Googles of the world, the Alibabas of the world, had so much personal data that they've held for so long. Nobody knows how much data they have, what that's truly valued. I think such insights would be hugely helpful. Thank you, Susan. Does anybody else want to take a shot at those two questions or shall I move to another question? Okay, Martin, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. Let me just uh, get back uh, on, on the second question by, uh, by Marida on um, digital services provided at zero price, or at, as we should say zero US dollar price or zero currency uh, price, whether that is trade or not. Uh, first of all, I'd say usually there is a price in, uh, in, in, in most cases. There are very, very few services that are actually uh, not and don't have any uh, return to the, to the provider. And, but even in, in those cases, why would, not, why would they not be trade? We have been uh, listening to, to radio through our, you know, we, from our childhood and uh, as consumers, it has always been free. And uh, that's, uh, as we know, it's still broadcasting services. So search services or email services, they, they still look um, like trade, even if we're actually not paying for it. And also, you know, from a very legalistic perspective, if we want, if we look at the guys and we look at trade agreements, we won't see that uh, trade agreements required a, a price for, for, or services don't require a price to be covered by the, by, the, by the trade agreements. They just have to not be performed by the government or a governmental function. So zero, uh, zero US dollar uh, services, they seem to be trade just like any other, at least in my opinion. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Anybody else? We can. 
Can I make a quick point on that? I yes, think, Javier. Uh, I think one of the key questions, and I completely agree with Martin, but the key questions is what service is it? And that's, that's kind of going towards what Vikram was saying, is that it might be you know, free for the consumer, but actually the company is making money out of it. And it might be utilizing that data flow to sell an advertising services some, somewhere else. So, so for me, one of the key questions is that data also makes it more difficult for us to understand what type of service is being transacted because of this sort of decoupling between the data flow and the provision of the service, which is endemic in multi-sided markets. Thanks, Javier. Um, okay, now I'm gonna to move to the next question. This is from Maria Savona. I think one of the most interesting issues here to unpack the political economy of data is the extent to which data is a production factor to be remunerated the way services were more labor intensive than manufacturing activities decades ago. It seems that it commands a rent rather than a remuneration. What does the panel think? And I know Susan wanted to take a shot at this question, so I'll, um, I'll let her take her first shot. Vikram, your hand is up, but I think that was left up. Right, so, um, and others who may want to weigh in on this question, please use the raise the hand function. Thank you, Susan, the floor is yours. I, I think I already made my point to this earlier, so I don't want to take the time for, uh, from other thoughtful people. Okay, Does are there any other thoughtful people on the panel? Uh, it's chock full of thoughtful people, if you ask me, but maybe they don't have a particular thought on this question. Uh, Javier raises his hand. And, Sorry, not that yeah, thoughtful. <laughs> go ahead. You're from OECD. We're used to it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I mean, I guess this is a point that I wanted to make earlier, but that we didn't have time to come on. And I think that Maria makes a really important point is that perhaps we don't understand the economics of data that well. And so replying to sort of Lee's point earlier, you know, we've developed some rules which certainly apply, uh, but we developed them at a time where we did not understand the full potential of the digital economy. And I'd actually argue that even today, we don't understand the full potential of the digital economy and the multifaceted nature of uh, data and cross-border data flows. So it makes it very difficult to sort of apply old rules to a concept that we're still just trying to understand at the moment. So it's the only thing I wanted to say. Thanks, Javier. I think, Javier, you participated in that workshop we held a few years ago where we tried to bring in chief economists from the various data platforms and get insights as to whether, how, how they view data as a uh, factor in their production function and nobody would answer the question, um, which I, I thought was pretty interesting. And many chief economists didn't come, they sent their uh, public relations people, but still it was a useful thing. But we were trying to get at that, um, that question some time ago. Does anybody else want to take a shot at this? Okay not seeing any hands go up. Um, uh, it's proposed that I ask for Lee Tuttle. Okay, are you ready, Lee? This is from Henri Pru. Are the GATS modes of supply, which establishes origin on a territorial and nationality basis, adequately, does it actually adequately capture the nature of digitally traded services and of the restrictive discriminatory measures applied to such services? Or is yours, Lee? Yeah, I was just reading the question. I, I do think it's pretty clear both, both mode one and mode three in particular uh, capture the supply of digital services, whether they be cross-border or whether a company enters a market and then say provides that market or provides them to other markets at, at, through a commercial presence. Um, and I think we've had case law that, that shows that the mode of supply is technology neutral. You had the case on online gambling we, uh, that Antigua brought against the United States, and we were able to deal with that case effectively. Um, so it, it clearly, the problem is not that the modes don't cover it. The problem is, and I think um, Javier uh, hinted at that, our classification system requires that there be a market access commitment to be able to enforce uh, you know your your rights to supply digital services and it's not clear where many of them are classified i mean 
Henry Gao and I have had all kinds of arguments about, uh, well, uh, you know, maybe Google search engine is, is, is a data processing service. Maybe it's a database service. Uh, and, uh, you know, our opinion doesn't matter until such time as there's a dispute settlement case and maybe a panel resolves some of these issues. Um, there's a lot of services that if you see our classification is technologically neutral, they could be digital services and be covered by the agreement. But even I, you know, who believe that technology neutrality takes you a long way, there's still services that I'm like, hmm, where would that go? <laughs> Thanks, uh, Lee. Henry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob, and thanks to Lee for reminding me of uh, a long-standing debate on whether uh, you know Google <laughs> services uh, would be classified and the uh, telecom services or computer and related services. We've been arguing this uh, since uh, you know Google pulled out of China uh, ten years ago. <laughs> uh, so uh, very nice memories. But uh, specifically on this uh, issue, I agree with uh, Javier. Uh, that uh, the classification issue is a key issue, and hopefully, I think the W2 members uh, can, uh, you know, solve this issue. And I think uh, they kind of already solved this issue. For example, if you look at many of the free trade agreements, they actually uh, decided to uh, um, define digital trade to, uh, you know, not uh, to take into account whether it should be classified as goods or services, uh, let alone, you know, which sector or subsector of services. So they kind of uh, avoided the issue by, you know, uh, clustering uh, digital trade issues altogether. But I think uh, there's another more important issue uh, because they solved the first issue. This issue has become more important. And this issue is the difference between different uh, uh, mode of supply. Uh, Lee mentioned that uh, mode one uh, and mode three can both be relevant, but what if, uh, uh, you know, the commitments by the W2 members are different uh, when it comes to mode one and uh, mode three. And as we all know, uh, on mode one, actually many W2 members uh, might see, uh, you know, uh, none, which means no limitations. And on, on mode three, they might see, uh, uh, well, you have to establish some local presence. So uh, unless we, we have a clear answer to which mode this would come under, I think uh, that uh, would provide uh, you know, a lot, uh, a lot of uh, business opportunities for lawyers to litigate these cases in the WTO. So this is a probably a more urgent issue, uh, and we really need to solve it in the ongoing negotiation. Thank you. Well, it's a good idea, yeah, as always, to provide opportunities for lawyers to litigate more, says the economist. <laughs> All right, I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative to move to the next section. Uh, the next question, uh, we had a good exchange there. And I do thank you for putting questions into the Q&A, but um, let's also take some time for the next two questions that we have. And then at the end, we'll come back to uh, questions from the participants on the floor. Third question, what is the role of trade policy in governing cross-border data flows of these different types of data? How do trade principles, and this is, I think, a new dimension, limit or improve data flows and data governance? Susan, let's hear from you first, then we'll go to Martin, Vikram, Henry, Lee, and Joel, if you feel like you've got some, uh, something to contribute. Basically, I would say that I believe, and this is just my opinion, that the principles really should apply, but I think we need to rethink the rules, particularly because as I said before, many countries, including my own, <laughs> the United States, do not yet know how to govern data. Nobody does the various types of data so that they can accommodate both innovation and protect their citizens from harm. Um, and I, I'm sorry, my opinion is so strong, but it is because these days, this is what I write on. Taking it just a little bit further is that I do think trade policy um, has an important role to play. The principles of non-discrimination, transparency and accountability, and the rule of law, these are, I, I, I they are what, I, why I think the GATT has succeeded for so long and why I think the WTO can and should succeed. But that said, um, 
And and my nation has played an incredible role in undermining it. Sorry for that political diss there, but hopefully that'll change. But I do think there is a huge problem, which is on regulatory coherence. I don't think there is enough incentives to encourage cooperation or interoperability of regulatory regimes. And um, I think um, there's a couple of things that we can do here. One thing that we can do is that Governments should do more to educate their citizens about what trade can and can't do and what tr the role that trade rules play. I've been saying this for all of my life. People really misunderstand and distrust what trade agreements do um, and give them much more power than they really have, in particular the WTO. Another thing is that um, trade capacity building needs to be linked to trade liberalization. We don't do enough of it. We do trade facilitation, but particularly in terms of governance, that's something I think that is really important. And I think UNICTRAL can play an important role here or similar type of organization on things like spam, consumer welfare, personal data protection. I think we don't focus enough on creating interoperability solutions. And so if we, if we could convene an international conference in the WTO, might be interested in doing it to develop and encourage internationally accepted strategies to protect personal data and consumer welfare by encouraging UNICTRAL to create a model law that will help us, I think, build trust. Finally, I do think the WTO has been one of the most transparent organizations, but it hasn't done enough to involve more people around the world to build trust. So for example, um, Lee, you might hate this idea. I'd be curious to know what you think about this, but why not crowdsource? You know, like one thing you could say is we're having trouble finding common ground on whether or not we should say anything about AI in, in a trade agreement. I'm just coming up with a silly example, but why not have a crowdsourcing site just as the Estonian government does and um, the the EU Parliament does, and, and ask people to, to work on a draft and see if they can come up with new ideas by involving the public more. And this is, I think, a gap in the WTO. Yes, it's an organization of governments, but if you want to build trust, the principles are all right, the strategies are out of date. Thanks very much, Susan. If members ask for that crowdsourcing, that would be great. The Secretary probably cannot. <clears throat> anyway, uh, Martin. Let's hear from you. Thanks a lot, Bob. Well, certainly trade agreements and the WTO as, uh, you know, as one of the most advanced fields of international law have a, a great role to play. And, uh, and Susan laid out you know, some of the key principles that, uh, uh, that, that are essential in this field. So you know, let me say from a, you know, from a World Bank perspective, um, here you know, we have a uh, we are supporting and we are, we are welcoming the uh, the negotiations and the talks and the, on uh, on e-commerce and the, under the WTI under the WTO under the framework of the GSI, and, and we certainly hope that that, that they give results. Um, but uh, but I do want to bring the, the attention to two important uh, issues. Uh, one is you know the multilateral rules, respect, you know, or even plurilateral rules under the WTO um, need to be inclusive of the international community. Um, and uh, you know, so far, if you look at the at the GSI of the, you know, if I understand correctly, eighty six members involved, you know, there is only one uh, one LDC. You know, for reference, the the trade facilitation agreement signed a few years ago currently has one hundred and fifty four WTO members signatories of it, including all thirty five LDC WTO members. And so this is the kind of inclusiveness that uh, that e-commerce rules you know should strive for and you know and and for that they have to in, um, take account of flexi flexibilities and the level of development of these members um, and second the other important aspect is that you know trade agreements are not the only relevant instrument to promote international trade now one point that that Jog mentioned very very early was that uh, um, rules on the aspects like data uh, you know, to promote trade, they also need harmonization, and uh, and that and trade agreements and the WTO has uh, you know has not proven the the, the best uh, forum forum to uh, to provide this kind of regulatory harmonization. So trade rules are important, 
to provide certain principles, but uh, the play, the international community should also look at other instruments, declaration, model laws, um, other types of soft law instruments that, uh, that promote um, regulatory harmonization, particularly in sensitive issues like uh, data interoperability, you know, standards for consumer protection, intermediate liability, and so on. So trade rules are important, but they are not the only important international rules on them for digital trade. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Uh, so I think I heard you suggest perhaps a regulatory sandbox might be a good approach that allows experimentation and adaptation over time. But that's my reading of what you said. Uh, Vikram, the floor is yours. Thanks, Bob. So I guess I should have said at the outset, I'm not a trade expert. So it's really fascinating to be, I feel like a bit of an interloper in the midst of all the uh, expertise here. But just to sort of offer a couple of um, uh, thoughts on the trade aspect from sort of an economic lens that uh, I think trouble us uh, over at the, at the IMF. And one is the move towards data localization in certain jurisdictions, which I think has been touched on already. We worry that data localization measures put in place by large data economies, countries with large economies, countries with very large populations, may be particularly challenging for uh, much smaller countries because they would no longer have access to the data of individuals in the larger agglomerations and the larger population centers. Think of a small startup in a small, uh, in a small country that wants to harvest the data in a large uh, uh, jurisdiction. Now, there may be ways, ways and ways of doing localization, and maybe the argument could be made that, look, a startup can have access, it doesn't really matter. But I think that is a question that we do worry about, that this would be something that would be particularly disadvantageous to uh, countries that, don't, that, are, that are small, basically, which encompass many of our members. I think the, going on in, this, in that same vein, and uh, in terms of the, uh, the potential drawbacks from a trade policy perspective for our smaller members, many of whom are fragile states as well, um, and, and, and linking this to the particular feature of privacy, I think an argument could be made that while we have naturally, uh, individual jurisdictions have important privacy uh, imperatives that they are concerned about, we do worry that this is something which could also in effect, I don't know if you think of this as a barrier to trade in some senses, but the argument, uh, and some colleagues of the World Bank have written about this, which I think is quite interesting. They make the argument that the complying with privacy requirements in some of the advanced economies can be quite costly, extremely costly in fact, and this can actually make it very difficult for uh, small businesses operating out of low-income countries to actually be able to establish presence and be able to conduct trade in services or even in goods in some cases. And I think that's something which uh, is, uh, is a concern that I would share from the trade policy perspective as well. When we think about privacy as a national prerogative, but you know, what does it mean from a, the perspective of what it implies for cross-border? And of course, I'm, I'm not even talking about you know, the big issue with the US and Europe you know, in terms of privacy shield and TREMS, which is you know, another sort of ongoing question about how different standards and privacy and national security have massive implications for international trade. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Vikram. Henry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I think there are many challenges trying to fit the existing paradigm of the trade agreements to data regulation, but I will be focusing on two plus uh, something on Chinese experience on uh, data regulation. Uh, the first challenge I see uh, for fitting uh, existing trade agreements uh, to data regulation is this concept uh, that we are so used to under the get, for example, of differentiating uh, all these trade measures into two categories. The first category is the border measure, like tariffs, and the second category is the domestic regulation, including both fiscal and non-fiscal regulations. But uh, does this really apply to the data economy? I mean, you can make an argument by saying that uh, cross-border data flow restrictions is like the border measures, while data localization requirements is like a domestic regulation. But then there are all these other types of uh, uh, restrictions, uh, for example, restrictions that are grounded on privacy protection or national security protection that could not be easily classified along the lines of uh, border measure versus domestic regulation. So that would really raise a challenge. 
The second issue is something that we touched upon briefly just now, this dichotomy between services and goods. Now, uh, even though nowadays uh, many of the free trade agreements have uh, avoided this issue by saying that uh, we just adopt a really broader definition on what constitutes digital products without producing on members' views of whether this constitutes goods or services. But still, uh, this is the issue that you still have to address uh, sooner or later, because depending on whether you classify this as a service as a goods, you would adopt a different uh, regulatory uh, framework. For uh, uh, goods, for example, uh, for uh, uh, the GET, uh, the uh, both national treatment and market access commitments uh, are unconditional obligations in the sense that uh, uh, you as W2 member are automatically assumed, for example, to provide national treatment. But that is not the case for services and the guests. Uh, the uh, national treatment obligation is a conditional obligation, and you only assume this obligation when you specifically include a sector in your schedule. So that is something, uh, again, that the uh, WTO members would have to uh, consider and choose uh, in future negotiations. The uh, third, uh, briefly, I will address the Chinese experience uh, when it comes to data regulation and uh, the development of its uh, e-commerce market. Now, uh, as we all know, China is the biggest e-commerce market in the whole world, and it is also one of the most restrictive when it comes to data regulation. And many different countries are actually drawing the wrong lesson here. They think that the reason why China was able to develop as the largest e-commerce market was because China adopted such a, a restrictive uh, data uh, and the digital regulation policies. But that is uh, the wrong reason. Uh, I think the reason why China developed to be the largest e-commerce market is because China is the largest market in the whole world, regardless of whether you are in the digital economy or, or not, because China is the largest population. So if you are a small country with a few million population, you think that by closing your doors, you can also become the, one of the largest players in e-commerce, uh, you are getting the wrong lesson. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. And they were able to leapfrog, I think, to some extent, um, technology. So, Lee, the floor is yours. Yeah, just uh, it's something Vikram said is, uh, in fact, we we uh, those of us who who know the services agreement well do feel that where there are commitments that localization is probably already cons inconsistent with cross-border commitments. For example, computer services have some of the highest incidence of open cross-border commitments. They could be better, but uh, you know, clearly localization may already violation of market access commitment on computer services, which is why governments sometimes justifiably, sometimes you know, we wonder, uh, try to shield them behind our exceptions. And there's a move, I think, to try to make the exceptions even than they already are, which worries me when you look at data localization. Um, I think the job of the WTO is in fact to establish very important uh, trade principles. And you, the, it is a problem that we have traditionally historically expected governments to implement them on the national level. I don't think there's a huge way around that. That doesn't mean that more collaboration shouldn't take place. Uh, and I think I do not like the crowdsourcing idea. I already said there's a lot of people who are expert in various areas, already collaborating, already coming up with ideas. I think the regulatory experts need to come up with more innovative ideas, sandboxes and other things, because I don't think best practice is clear yet. And so innovation, regulatory innovation needs to take pace. I must say just about, I worked for 30 years with telecommunications and ministries and regulators who have now become ICT uh, regulators and ministries and digital economy you know, uh, regulators uh, for many of these issues, not all of them, but they are already launching multi-stakeholder and multi-agency, multi-ministry meetings and are being encouraged by ITU to do so because of the cross-cutting issues. I mean, and I don't think that will ever should result in harmonization because I want to see innovation in regulation as well as in services. But I do think the interoperability, compatibility is important. If you have too much harmonization, 
you may have harmonized on the wrong answer. Thanks, Lee. Very good point. Joel, the floor is yours. Muting. You're still muted. So if you unmute, try to unmute. Here I am. Uh, I'm so uh, I think you know. The, the, I think the core of this question is: Does the trade law system restrict the right to regulate in data? A and I would say that the answer is generally no. I, I don't see a lot of trade law problems with states' ability to regulate. I, I see the reverse problem, which we'll get to in the next question, which is that, uh, that uh, states may be regulating in ways that are inconsistent with free trade. The, the one area I wanted to highlight is, uh, and, and Henry um, really already suggested this, so I, I just want to expand uh, on what he said, is that uh, non-discrimination rules, both in uh, the goods agreements and in the GATS, um, are, are particularly challenging in this area. And, and let me give the example of cybersecurity, uh, where you might think about the China-Australia dispute regarding Huawei 5G and the problem that it's the, I, the very identity of the source country or the controlling country that may be critical to the security evaluation. And so um, if the distinction in um, a national regulation, a national restriction is based on the identity of the source or controlling country, we have the question, is, is that discrimination? And of course we have questions about security exceptions and general exceptions and whether that's available. I, I would note that the, uh, the sanitary and phytosanitary measures agreement of the WTO allows source-based distinction, depending on whether a disease is endemic in a particular country. And, and we may need to see something like that. And, and another analogy is the Argentina financial services case from 2016, where the WTO appellate body didn't make a finding on whether services of companies, com services of companies from non-tax cooperating countries are uh, comparable or like services for purposes of anti-discrimination rules to services of tax cooperating countries. So that's analogous to this question of data regulation in a home country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. Um, I think what we'll do, if you uh, could put your hands down, that would be very helpful. And uh, Nicholas, please put your, I think it was a dog down. <laughs> very, very loving pet there. Let's move on to our last question. National cooperation. How might WTO interact more closely with other frameworks, institution, and agreements relevant to data flows? So we've heard some references to the need for this. Let me start with Joel, and we'll go to Henry, Javier, Nicholas, and um, Lee. So Joel, the floor is yours again. Thank you. Uh, so uh, there are different techniques for mediating uh, between trade goals and these, uh, these various other goals, which is at the core of the problem as we've been discussing. Uh, the ones that I'll focus on uh, are proportionality requirements, uh, recognition arrangements, and third, uh, references to international standards. Um, but but the, that issue I mentioned about discrimination uh, is also important. And, and as uh, Lee's pointed out in the chat, there are exceptions, of course, uh, but those exceptions have some limits, uh, especially the, the security exception, I, I would note. Um, and, and they're subject to evaluation by judges. And, you know, we, we don't have an appellate body at the moment, but the question is whether these very specific questions of integrating different regulatory goals should be decided by judges or should be decided by trade negotiators or by cybersecurity negotiators or others. And, and I would tend to argue 
that um, it's good for judges to provoke the system, but then it's good for legislators and diplomats to work out the, the specifics. So uh, by on, on uh, requirements of proportionality, uh, those exist for goods in the, uh, in the technical barriers to trade agreement and the sanitary and phytosanitary measures agreement but not in the general agreement on trade and services. So, so a lot depends on whether we've got a service or a good. Again, there we have uh, an important role of the judge to engage in proportionality balancing, which is more limited than cost benefit analysis balancing. And I think that may raise some concerns also. Um, second on uh, recognition. It's not required, uh, but is permitted in the WTO system. There's, there's some argument that a proportionality requirement would include a requirement to recognize or to uh, regard as equivalent regulation of another state where it satisfied the regulatory concern. I think Article 7 of GATS is very interesting because it provides for what I've termed open recognition, the idea that you can have a recognition system as a state as long as you provide opportunities to other states um, in um, connection with, uh, with that recognition regime. Uh, there are serious questions in my mind about whether recognition regimes uh, otherwise and in the goods area or the TBT area within goods uh, could be argued to be discriminatory along the lines that I suggested uh, in, in connection with the prior question. And then last, let me refer to references to international standards. And, and the, you know, the WTO, I think one of the great virtues of the WTO uh, has been to defer to standard setters uh, in other specialty areas, not to try to establish standards inside the WTO. And, and that's, of course, what's done in these goods agreements that I've mentioned. They provide for references. They kind of harden, in some ways, soft law from places like the International Organization for Standardization, the IOS. Um, and uh, Annex 7, Paragraph A of the Telecoms Agreement uh, provides that members undertake to promote international standards through the work of relevant bodies that, that might. Uh, be relevant here. Uh, but the problem is, uh, and it's not a WTO problem, it's a rest of the world problem, is that there are few international standards. Uh, I, I focus on cybersecurity in some of my work, and cybersecurity has only a few very general norms without specificity, without operational characteristics. And so I think in order to integrate, in order to have a system for referencing international standards, we need to encourage the establishment of more of those, of those international standards. And I'll just say on, on security exceptions, uh, the security exceptions, while they're, um, according to a panel report from 2019, they're, they're not self-judging. They're still very broad and not very well articulated for this area of data governance. And, and especially in cybersecurity, which as I say, I've focused on. So, so I think we need more work on specifying what the security exception is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, Henry, your thoughts on this, please. Thank you, Bob. Uh, now, I'm going to focus on the first part of the question, and I'm going to be more forward-looking and try to see how WT members can reach some sort of agreement, uh, despite their uh, main differences when it comes to data regulation uh, and uh, trade agreements. Now, um, even though uh, the challenges are huge, but I think uh, the past experience of the WT has provided some answers here. Uh, and uh, this would be uh, the model along the lines of the Trade Facilitation Agreement or the TFA with tiered obligations corresponding to the individual level of development of the different members. So I would argue that uh, in the end for the GSIE commerce negotiations to succeed, we would need to have something structured along the lines of the TFA. At the core of the agreement, there should be a set of commonly accepted minimum standards or basic principles 
probably along the lines of the highly successful example of the telecom reference paper and the guests. To enhance the participation of development countries, there should also be technical assistance provisions to help development countries progressively undertake more and more obligations. A major part of the technical assistance activities should be devoted to building the technological capacities for development countries by equipping them with the necessary hardware and software. But uh, another important part is that there should also be regulatory assistance products as many development countries lack the necessary regulatory experience with the digital sector. In terms of the substantive content, uh, I think such agreements should include the following elements. First of all, freedom of data flow for the provision of covered services investment and the intellectual property rights. And second, prohibition of data localization requirements relating hardware, software, or location of data storage, uh, which, nar which narrowly defined exceptions for measures to protect the data security or personal information. Uh, and also third commitments for each party to introduce or maintain its own domestic laws on privacy protection that meets certain minimum standards. Now, uh, some people might be skeptical because they are saying that, uh, for example, China would never agree to provisions on free flow of data and a prohibition of data localization requirements. Uh, but I'm more optimistic. Uh, I've argued long, argued that uh, China would eventually agree. And actually last year, when the RCEP was signed, uh, if you look at the provisions of the RCEP on e-commerce, you can see that China did agree to uh, uh, take on obligations on free flow of data and also prohibition on data localization requirements. Even though this comes with the caveat of heavy uh, exceptions for either national security or for public order uh, reasons, but I think that is still a big step forward and we should encourage China and other developed countries to go along uh, rather than uh, discourage them from uh, participating. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Javier. So, uh, I, I want to focus on the existing international architecture. Um, often my colleagues, which are two floors down in the science, technology and innovation department, remind me that they've been talking about transborder data flows since the late 70s, early 80s. So what I want to do is sort of place trade discussions that are taking place now in that uh, context. And we recently did a mapping exercise of regulatory approaches to cross-border data transfers. And one of the key things that we found is that there's no single mechanism that enables this free flow of data uh, with trust and that governments pursue different, multiple complementary approaches in this area. And of course, trade agreements is one of them, but also we've discussed some of the unilateral approaches. And here it's, you know, things such as standard contractual clauses and binding corporate rules, which are very useful tools, which are also fitting, which can complement some of the discussions in the, in the trade agreements. I also want to mention the plurinatural arrangements. And we haven't really spoken very much about the APEX CDPR or the non-binding elements of the OECD privacy guidelines or Convention 108. And these are agreements which deal with specific types of data in specific circumstances, and they've made quite a lot of progress in time. And then there's the last bit, which is sort of the standards and the technology-driven initiatives. And we've identified or we've talked about the ISO standards, which are very important, but also I think there's a technological solution to some of these problems. And privacy-enhancing technologies might be that. And now what's I think really interesting is that when we look at this international architecture, the first thing that we see is that there's a lot of commonalities, both within and between the different instruments. One of these commonalities is that there's wide consensus on this dual goal of enabling the flow of data, but also protecting and trying to ensure that that data flows with some form of trust. The second element I want to highlight is the growing evidence of convergence. And what we're seeing in trade agreements is that these increasingly combine uh, data flow provisions with requirements for privacy and data protection. Um, and I think that that's an important element in terms of trying to see where the convergence is going, but also that we're seeing more and more convergence in the privacy principles themselves. So countries are increasingly using the same types of privacy principles on which we might be able to build that interoperability. And the last thing I want to highlight is that there's a high degree of complementarity between the different instruments. So for example, these unilateral mechanisms that we've seen, uh, they draw from and they contribute to different plurilateral arrangements such as Convention 108 or the OECD privacy guidelines. 
We see a lot of more references and trade agreements to uh, the OECD privacy guidelines or to the APEX CDPRs, and I think that that's important in making these complementary. And we also see that standards and technological solutions have the potential to be used in combination or to be referenced in the different uh, trade agreements. So one of the things that I want to end on is that what is particularly interesting about trade agreements from my viewpoint is that it covers all types of data. A lot of these plurilateral arrangements or unilateral approaches tend to be focused on one specific type of data. So trade agreements have the power to sort of draw on the governance uh, that's been built in these, reference them and be able to push them further and to deal with more di different types of data. Thank you very much, Javier. Nicholas, uh, can we hear from uh, your perspective? Please. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. And I want to focus a little bit more on the, on the on the process side of things. And uh, I think this is important because bridging the gap between developing economies uh, and others is something that Chile has been trying to do at the WTO and elsewhere. So um, in this context, I believe that one of the core issues uh, is that we have to yet to sit down and have a clear understanding among everyone sitting at the table on what the nature and purpose of the internet is or what we want it to be. Um, is it a global open and competitive environment that fosters creativity and innovation that uh, everybody can uh, use or is it something else? Um, I think we need to have this frank conversation around uh, this in order to achieve common goals based on the social and economic value we expect from this platform. And this requires us to have uh, as a broad and inclusive discussion uh, around uh, the issues that we face, uh, particularly on data. Uh, what is data? Uh, what's the data taxonomy, so to say? And um, because if not, we're not going to have clear goals and we're going to be circling around uh, discussing different things, uh, uh, so to say. Um, I would encourage everyone to, uh, um, to try to understand how the technical side of things also regulates the internet and how the legal perspective or the legal regulation that we put in place also affects this technical architecture of the internet. So um, we need to understand that uh, these are not only regulatory issues from a purely legal perspective, uh, but also issues that have to be seen from a technical perspective. And we need to have uh, perhaps other institutions involved in these kinds of conversations. Uh, uh, some of them are based in Geneva, but some of them are not. Uh, uh, some of them uh, uh, are not usually included in these kinds of global discussions. And, and, and this is something that we need to uh, acknowledge, include more people, uh, try to understand where, where everybody's coming from and uh, have clear goals on what we want to do with this global platform that um, has brought so much value to uh, economies like the one that I'm representing today, uh, the, 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 my country. Um, I think that's uh, a core issue. And uh, of course, the WTO is a really important venue for this. Uh, uh, the WTOs and the trading, and the multilateral trading systems uh, uh, principles are, are key uh, uh, things that uh, are going to help us uh, uh, to achieve this. Transparency, collaboration, cooperation, the non-discrimination features of both the GATT and the GATS uh, uh, are things that uh, uh, we should uh, include in these kinds of conversations when we talk about data. But first, we need to know what we're talking about and then reach out to everybody that must have a say in this. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, excellent perspective. Um, and repeating, I think, a perspective that we've heard from a number of speakers. Um, now, I think we have Lee and Vikram. Um, Lee, did you have some follow-up observations on this? And then we'll yeah, go I've, um, on, this, on this question, I think it's one of the most important for the institution that we are. Um, and I think uh, Joel made a couple of extremely important points. One that I think he's absolutely right, that the WTO does not unduly interfere with, with, with domestic regulations of, of most kinds. And an example is another thing he mentioned that the WTO may set standards for process and transparency, I, I mean, principles for process and transparency of standards, but it has never set standards. And as, as an old timer, I, I don't think it should. I think the experts, as I mentioned before, should be the ones who set standards. 
But that leads to the question of how do these these groups that do work on standards often are divorced from the trade community, so they may not be as familiar as they might be with the standards. And I think that's an outreach effort. Um, I think that the issue of the layers is really important for what WTO may do is that this whole data flows issue is two very separate things that um, um, Nicola had, had, Nicholas has referred to. You have the layer of does the data flows mean or, or not agreeing to data flows mean that, that, that people are going to interfere with the infrastructure level of the internet? And then you have the data as information and content level of data flows. And I think the two discussions have been somewhat melded and confused and, and they're very different discussions when you think about implementation and standards that would, would be developed. Finally, I think, you know, the, the, the secretariat certainly works with the various communities involved in these kinds of things. We've had UNCITRAL come and talk to us within the secretariat. We've invited UNCITRAL to seminars for members and so on. I mean, I've gone to IGF meetings. And in fact, I've seen some trade negotiators at internet governance forum meetings, not very many, um, but you do get a lot of secretariat interaction uh, in our areas of expertise with all of the international organizations, the private sector and the NGOs in these areas, at least in the services division, that's how we function. Um, members, are they doing enough? Like I said, I saw one, a uh, few trade negotiators at internet governance forum meetings. Um, I'd like to see more, but there was a phenomenon for a while when we were doing a lot of IT and e-commerce negotiations that some of the governments had staff that specialized in this area. And I think those staff became quite well informed when they specialized in this area. Um, I haven't seen so much of that recently. So what's happening is delegations are bringing some of their people who do specialize in various aspects of IT trade, telecom uh, networks and, and, and e-commerce uh, coming to the WTO as part of their multi-ministerial delegations. Um, other forms of outreach to other organizations. I'm not sure how much a trade uh, official will know what's going on in the cybersecurity world. We've tried to do seminars that help educate them on that. Um, it, more collaboration across regulatory experts so that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing will be important. Thank you, Lee. Vikram. Thanks, Bob. The hour grows late, so I'll try to be super brief. Just two quick points. I think just picking up on what Lee said, actually, you know, to me, a lot of this discussion is about the complexity of data and the huge challenge there is from a sort of from a sort of regulatory cooperation perspective point of view. So one of the things that we would argue from our side is that, I mean, there are many ways of solving this that you could think of more complicated, less complicated. We wonder whether a place to start would be to at least have some agreement on principles that, I mean, which are probably a bit softer than standards in some of these areas. And I'll give you a couple of examples. But so one question is, should, should we be talking about principles on the management of data? And then the second question would be, well, then, you know, where is this discussion and debate hosted? Is it a, is it a trade thing that the WTO would take on? You know, is it going to be more informal? So that's a question to me. And just to give you just to flesh, just to give you some quick examples of what I mean by principles. So take competition policy, for example. You know, a remedy that's being discussed much in competition space when it comes to data as principle is sort of having interoperability or data portability requirements. Different jurisdictions may do this very differently. Should we have a principle about you know like one some common minimum approach to data portability and uh, 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 interoperability? If you think about the financial regulation space, you know, a big topic is AI standards on AI discrimination. Those kinds of questions, you know, should we have some similar approaches and standards or principles on that? Take privacy, for example. Uh, you know, a big issue I've read about in the medical space, given that we're so focused these days on medical issues. Uh, the director of NIH was making the point that um, uh, GDPR has been a big issue for cross-border medical collaboration. You know, they're doing a diabetes study. They cannot get access to data on Finnish subjects of a part of the study because it's now caught under GDPR. So, you know, should we have some discussion about standards on, you know, exceptions to this, standards on anonymization, 
you know, these kinds of questions come up uh, to my mind at the end of this discussion as to, you know, what's the way forward in, in principles and standards and, you know, who should kind of coordinate, organize it? Is it, a, it should it be the WTO or should it be somebody else? You know, these are, to our minds, open questions where we see a need out here that needs to be filled. Thank you very much, Vikram. Well, we have one minute left. Uh, we do have some questions in the Q&A, but I don't think we have time to turn to them. I personally have another commitment that I need to move to. Um, but this has been uh, an exceptionally uh, useful conversation, and I would very much like to thank all of the panelists uh, and uh, they're taking the time, engaging in the development of the panel and then sharing their insights. Um, Hopefully we can synthesize some of what we've heard and share that more broadly. I would encourage you, if you get a chance, to look at the Q&A and perhaps if you know the individual, send an answer, uh, particularly if they've uh, sent you uh, a specific request. So um, thank you all. And I wish you uh, a good morning, a good evening, uh, Henry, and um, a good afternoon to those of us in Central European time. Uh, thanks again, and um, much appreciated. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you both. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.